In his 1600 classic De Magneta, William Gilbert of Colchester writes, Many things are thereby seen to attract, both those which are formed by nature alone and those which are by art prepared, fused, and mixed. Nor is this so much a singular property of one or two things, as is commonly supposed, but the manifest nature of very many, both of simple substances, remaining merely in their own forms, and of compositions, as of hard sealing wax, and of certain other mixtures besides, made of unctuous stuffs. With this, Gilbert marks the beginning of a new kind of science, the science of electricity. And while he was not the first to consider this tendency of some objects to attract bits of paper and chaff, what we today call static electricity, he was the first to remark upon this phenomenon as a general property of many materials, and his scientific approach of relying upon demonstration and repeatable experiments marks a turning point in the history of science and the beginning of what we now call the scientific revolution. It was also in this work that we find the first electrical measuring instrument, which Gilbert generically called a versorium, his term for a compass needle. Unlike an ordinary compass needle, however, the versorium he describes is unmagnetized so that it will not respond to the Earth's magnetic field and will not be affected by nearby iron. The effect that Gilbert demonstrates instead is this. When an electrically charged object is brought near to the versorium needle, the needle is attracted to the object just like a compass needle would be attracted to a piece of iron. He says, Make yourself a versorium of any metal you like, three or four digits in length, resting rather lightly on its point of support after the manner of a magnetic needle, to one end of which bring up a piece of amber or a smooth and polished gem which has been gently rubbed, for the versorium turns forthwith. What you're seeing in the video here is me fabricating the versorium as Gilbert drew it in De Magneta. Today we would call the versorium an electroscope. I tried to keep my tools strictly to what was available in the period, although I use modern soldering equipment. It's really difficult to get the versorium to balance, uh, so when I'm doing actual experiments, I do away with the fancy needle and use a piece of copper wire suspended from a string. It's tempting to ask ourselves, what led Gilbert in this time to investigate the nature of electricity in such a modern way? And herein lies the first issue with describing the history of science. The natural approach is to show how science evolved into the system we have now, but scientists, especially of Gilbert's period, can't be separated neatly into progressives and regressives, those who would see science move forward to what it is today, and those who would see it revert to being more religious, philosophical, or magical. Instead, we must accept that different people had different goals and different ideas of the purpose science and reasoning should serve. If everybody had been unified with a constant idea of the roles of truth and knowledge in society, then perhaps we could have an easier time saying who was progressive and who was conservative. But this was definitely not the case. To better understand the cultural and religious background for Gilbert's work, I recommend finding a book about the scientific revolution, like Hugh Kearney's Science and Change from 1500 to 1700. For this video, I'd like to focus instead on Gilbert's investigations in De Magneta, how they were performed, and what they tell us about electricity and the electrical science in general. So having given that small disclaimer, let's begin with the science. My reference for these experiments is S.P. Thompson's 1900 translation of De Magneta from the original Latin into English. The translation itself is, in my opinion, a bit stilted, but the real value comes from the detailed endnotes which Thompson provides. In note 127, he gives a list of 20 experimental discoveries which Gilbert made. For my own part, while I was reading book 2, I kept a list of excerpts, eventually narrowing down the list to 6 main results, although the first result is really a collection of 9 experiments I lumped together. One of the most important discoveries Gilbert made was finding that many different materials can be electrified and to varying degrees, not only amber, jet, and diamond, which were known before 1600. In fact, materials recorded to show the electric effects, some of whose names are now pretty obscure, include lincurium, ruby and garnet, jasper, lychnis, and diamond. 
To this list, Gilbert adds a large number of minerals and organic solids which are electrifiable, and also a number of materials which cannot be electrified with any amount of rubbing. How did Gilbert determine whether materials can be electrified? First, he was well aware that experiments were most easily performed in dry, cool weather, and he states that the moisture in the air has a direct role in the difficulty of electrifying solids. So, in as dry an atmosphere as possible, he rubs the material with pretty stiff silk or a rough wool rag which is as little soiled as possible, or the dry palm, by which he means of the hand. If the material is amber, it can also be rubbed with other amber, with diamond, with glass, or other materials. Let's get our feet wet with some basic experiments. Here I have a simple versorium made from brass with an adjustment screw and a thread holder, which actually comes from a mechanical pencil. It's off axis, but that's actually on purpose because everything is all at odd angles. I don't have access to amber, it's a fairly expensive material and you might end up getting copal or other less electrifiable materials. So instead I'm taking advantage of our more modern knowledge of tripoelectricity, that's the modern name for building charge by rubbing or physical contact, and I'm using my arm rubbed up against a sheet of Teflon, the kind of sheet used for t-shirt presses. Rubbing it on my arm produces a very obvious deflection of the versorium needle. According to Gilbert, electrification requires friction and dull heat until the object gives off a dull polish. It must be slightly warm and smooth for most materials. This comes with a number of caveats. Just because the material is polished does not mean that it can be electrified. The rubber should not scratch but should produce a polish. When rubbed too hard, the attraction is weak, but with gentle and rapid rubbing, the attraction is much improved. Attraction can last up to five minutes for the best materials like amber and jet. And finally, the electric effect should appear immediately. Some of these results are easily confirmed. It's very humid in this room, actually about 70%, and I'm having a hard time electrifying anything. Using dry skin, or oily skin for that matter, as the rubber is working well, and because the rubber is generating friction, it's true that the object gives off a dull heat at first. Some other results, however, are clearly mistaken. An object does not require a polish to be electrified, as this coarse Teflon sheet shows. Also, if the amber and jet can remain electrified for several minutes, then clearly the heat would dissipate rapidly, so the objects do not need to radiate heat. I experimented with several materials, both for the rubber and the electric. For example, a glass rod rubbed with a hat made of alpaca fur, or a polystyrene rod rubbed against a wool cloth. I had limited success with a few of Gilbert's electrics, such as quartz, which he called crystal, because it was too difficult to electrify in this humid weather, so I'll have to revisit these experiments in the winter. There are more observations that Gilbert makes relating to the behavior of electrics. He says that the electric effect is blocked by interposing a piece of paper or a silk cloth, which we see verified here, although I don't have a silk cloth. With the paper in place, no electric attraction occurs, but once it is removed, the needle immediately turns. With a few more materials, such as this candle, we can recreate other effects. Rubbing the polystyrene stick, we see that the frisorium turns. Now repeating this rubbing action, then putting the stick into the flame, and no more electric effect is seen. Now blowing at the candle, and rubbing the stick once again, watch the smoke closely and see how it behaves as the electric is brought near. The smoke is attracted, forming a sort of film with the electric. Using a piece of leather and the styrene stick, we see that the needle is still attracted and strongly creating a bit of chaos. By rubbing it again, then immersing it in water, and the electric effect is destroyed. rubbing it once more, and dipping it in oil, and we see that the oil has no impact on the electric property. We have thus verified the majority of Gilbert's original observations. For all the new experiments he performed relating to the electrical science, it's interesting to note the loose ends he leaves. To be fair, his description of electricity was more of a digression than an actual investigation, his primary focus being magnetism, but there was much yet to be asked. For instance, if two pieces of amber are rubbed, do they both become electrified? And if so, does this similarly hold for other rubbing materials? If both the electric and the rubber become electrified, do they similarly attract each other? 
Such a line of reasoning seems obvious, but out of the few researchers who picked up from Gilbert's work, nobody thought to ask. It was another hundred years before the electrical repulsion was observed at all, and another 30 years after that that we find the first experiments showing that there are two types of electricity, what we now call positive and negative.